everyone. This is What the F is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly webinar, Wednesdays, 12 p.m. Eastern, where we spend 20 minutes every Wednesday discussing um, a hot topic out of Latin America. This week, we are honored to be broadcasting from Havana, Cuba, with a very distinguished guest, Ricardo Alarcón who I've asked, just asked what his most recent title is, and he has told me XXXXX, former, former, former. He's had every role, um, prestigious role in his country's government over the last 60 years. Or more. 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 How many years? Well, since I was a student leader, mm -hmm. 60 years. 60 years, starting as a student leader. Can you tell us a little bit about the student movement then? Then, we have a very strong tradition here. By the way, in a couple of days, we the anniversary of the, the creation of the Student University Student Federation, FEU, who is uh, older than the Premium Movement Organization, older than the present organization. It was one of the first uh, social organization created in Cuba in 1922. Since that moment, uh, it was a, a rather odd situation because those who were at the university, like myself, belonged to a, a very small minority. Mm -hmm. The majority of the young people in Cuba couldn't finish even the high school uh, to go to the university and finish uh, a career. Uh, See, this is really wonderful that you're sharing this with us because last night we saw Catherine Murphy's film Maestra uh -huh. about the illiteracy, illiteracy program a exactly. and educating the population because so few people were able to attend. I am, I am very proud of that uh, background of mine because. Uh, uh, we were probably one of the more strange organizations. We belong to a privileged segment of the society and we fought strongly to end those privileges. In the revolution... For yourself or because you saw how many others were denied that privilege? The vast majority. Uh, for example, uh, apart from what the revolution did at the beginning, the literacy campaign, to, to, that gave the opportunity to millions of people to, to read and write and so on. Apart from that, you can even now see the proof of what I am going to tell you, the system of University becas, what do you say? Becas? Scholarships. 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 Uh, that began in 1960 when I was at the Federation, the Student Federation. The buildings are there. It's still now, still now they are lodging young people who are studying from, from the interior part of Cuba or foreigners from other countries. Malecon and Twelve, Linea and H, Third uh, Avenue and F. Um, there were four or five buildings that were devoted to lodge young people who couldn't continue their university students studies because we didn't have a family in Havana with Cosmoni and, and, and so on. And the buildings are still there and they are being used for the same purpose 60 years mm -hmm. after. The only difference is that now we have a lot of foreigners, students from the Caribbean, from Latin America, from Africa, that are in, in you, you can go there and you will see thousands of then, uh, I was to answer your question about, about yeah, yeah. So, so I just want to let the audience, our, our listeners, know that 
Um, I first met you here in this building, yes. in this complex, February of 2015, on a Code Paint delegation. And you were our very first lecture, our very first morning. You spoke to us, you spent the morning with us. And I learned so much in that two hours, listening to you, everything from your years in, in, in New York and Washington during the Kennedy administration. This was fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the principal things we talked about um, that morning was the Cuban embargo, mm -hmm. which has since been expanded under the Trump administration. Yeah. And so I'd like to talk about that a bit and also um, how this mechanism is now being used um, as basically a form of U.S. foreign policy and economic warfare, not only on Cuba, but we're seeing this against Venezuela, Nicaragua, mm -hmm. Syria, North Korea. It's a form of warfare. It's been a form of warfare against Cuba for 60 years. Definitely. You see, more than having a discussion about if it is an embargo or a blockade, it's more than that. It's an economic warfare. Economic warfare. But an economic warfare that now is conducted by a bunch of people that operated with a mafia style way of operating. I don't want to be rude to President Trump, but, but uh, the way he conducted affairs as, uh, as president uh, can only be compared with the way a mafia mob leader would act. And this, Cuba has experience with that. Okay. Yeah, complete. Yeah. No, but we didn't have, uh, we are learning now a new dimension of, of this uh, warfare because uh, at this particular moment, uh, it is not only a matter of having governments, states, organizations that may abide or not with the American wish to uh, affect Cuba economically. No, it's a, it's not, concrete action that they taking day and night to threaten uh, ship uh, owners or ship captains or people involved in any manner in this process of trading with Cuba, particularly regarding oil and uh, because they know this, that's a, a one of our weaknesses. So you have transportation oil that comes in from Venezuela, or maybe comes in on different ships now, yes? So your electrical, diesel generating oils. Um, so you have, you have, you, do, you rely, you, um, Cuba depends on petroleum for two principal things, transportation oil, correct? Uh -huh. And that, I believe, comes from Venezuela? And the electricity. And the electrical, the diesel for electricity. Yeah. yeah. The. Yeah, and the, the problem is that, uh, well, they have every day, they announce from Washington that a new ship line had been added to the list of uh, uh, designated persons. Yeah. It's a very straight <laughs> way to refer to the enemy list. Yeah. Uh, which is the U.S. Department of Treasury's and the, the most recent was a Panamanian company mm. that uh, why? What was their biggest sin to have transported oil from Venezuela to Cuba? It's a completely normal uh, operation that happens there every day, but uh, you have known in Washington uh, a bunch of people that. Uh, pretend to impose their will over everybody else uh, and using not very good manners to say this. That's a, that's a very diplomatic way to put it. <laughs> not that's using good manners, I think you're very good at your job. So tell us a little bit about what it's been like in Cuba um, the last year with this with the expansion of sanctions and particularly the last several months mm -hmm. with the with the lack of um, oil imports. Yeah, the, 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 
so-called experts, the so-called uh, intelligent politicians in America, always use as an excuse the importance of Florida as a oh, election yes. and the importance of the Cuban-American vote. That's a complete nonsense, complete uh, inaccuracy, to say the least again diplomatically. Because the majority of the Cuban Americans are against the environment, are in favor of the historic regulation, and are the main victims of the last steps taken by the Trump administration. When they forbid uh, traveling between Florida and some Cuban uh, airports. Yeah. Every, every airport except Havana. Except Havana. Yeah. That means that the person who lives uh, in Eastern Cuba, for example, uh, would have a lot of uh, difficulties in getting the visit of their parents coming from, from Miami because they would have to come to Havana, from Havana to go uh, using the oil and the fuel that is denied to see their parents. But imagine the reverse. An old lady living in Eastern Cuba who wants to visit her grandchildren in Miami, they have to go from that place to Havana. They cannot do so direct, direct flight that uh, would be the, the normal thing, let's say. What the purpose of that? What the, what the aim? Simply to affect, to damage individual human beings when this, the embargo began, that all this uh, policy of uh, economic warfare, there is a very important uh, key element that was an, an, an internal memo in the State Department, an assistant secretary of the state, who referred to that as a very succinct way to put things. The majority of Cubans support Castro. The only way to reduce their support is by imposing economic and material hardships to the population in order to provoke uh, desperation and the overthrow of the, of the government. So the that sanctions was, are now for the first time targeting the people. Uh, the, the, Mr. Trump doesn't like uh, reading very much according to what they have <laughs> read. But apparently he read that memo. <laughs> and that is his guide to create hardship, create uh, uh, desperation. Mm -hmm. uh, in the I think that's really important for our viewers to understand is that despite how uh, the narrative in the U.S. media and from the U.S. government telling the U.S. population that sanctions are directed at certain businesses and government officials and yet the State Department memo clearly clearly the, the, it's the, the, the end word was well, not the, the, the leaders the governmental official, not only the name, what the people yeah. that have been so for decades, the, not this generation, their parents and their grandparents have been going through that uh, kind of life, clearly conceived to provoke softening in the population, to have the population then revolt against the regime. That's it. That is the, the logic and it succinctly explained in yeah. that memo. And uh, that memo was approved, by the way, because it, uh, on the side of the document, you can see it's a, it's a, it's a, it was classified, but this many years ago was declassified. You can see the, the signature of the Secretary of State and these two letters, OK. 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 okay. And who was the Secretary of State then? I think it was a. Uh, I should. Let me see. It was a. Uh, 
Herter, Christian Herter, o, o, I don't know. Were you United. serving in the United States then? How long, what years were you in the United States? I was in, well, I really was in New York. Yeah, in New York. More, yeah. more than the United States. I spent there 14 and a half years continuously, and then I returned for two more, year, more years, and I was, was, went back and forth for um, practically my, half of my life. Wow. Don't New York, you know, say, well, I, I yeah. once had the opportunity to go to San Francisco. Oh, my okay. I went to San Francisco uh, invited with some, some friends in the Solidarity Movement. I remember that we attended the celebration, it was the anniversary of one of progressive papers in, in, in the country that was issued from, from San Francisco and uh, uh, beautiful city. Yeah, it is very beautiful. And beautiful people. Yes, here as well. Yeah. yeah. So I wonder, you know, we're talking about sanctions, the Cuban embargo and how it is very clearly designed by the U.S. to harm the general population of the country. Uh -huh. um, I was um, in Venezuela twice this year. I spent mm -hmm. three months earlier this year and then a couple of weeks this summer. And um, Cuba and Venezuela are fast, hard mm -hmm. allies. How, um, how would you evaluate what the sanctions are, how the sanctions are affecting your allies in Venezuela? They are affecting them, in my opinion, I imagine very much. Um, but the Venezuelans have, have been resisting and, and, uh, and trying to be creative in how to, to fight back Something that is missed in, in the American strategy is, is that they, those who elaborate their policies in the country do not understand history and do not understand how uh, other peoples think or behave. Um, and I think that in Venezuela you have also a lot of uh, examples now of people creativities, from people developing initiatives to try to counteract against the, uh, those policies. And the fact is that they, uh, they are there, the revolution continues in, in Venezuela, and we in our case in Cuba, we learn a lot, uh, thanks to the American aggression, yes. <laughs> a lot. Cubans are, pro are yes. probably one of the most advanced mm -hmm. people in in capability to create, to invent, to resolve things. Uh, I remember the contrast between New York and my experience in New York, my experience in Cuba. Uh, for a Cuban, if, you, if your radio or TV set is broken, you will find a way to, to, to make it function again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In, in, the, in the consumer society, you will simply throw it away, away and, <laughs> and buy another one. That, that's it. And for us, it's inconceivable, sure, because you can have always a way to, to get out of those difficulties. And, and it was done nationally, massively, uh, with that policy, which does not mean, of course, that people have not suffered. They, they succeeded in making people suffer, but they will never succeed in making people to revolt in favor of those who made them suffer. That's crazy, you have to be really stupid to, to think that way. That's not the way our history shows us. And your people. I mean, it's just, it's just, as we walk, as we visit um, different yeah. institutions and walk the streets, and go out in the evening for dinner, music, mm -hmm. it's so, clear that the Cuban people are united as a culture, yeah. as a people. They understand the foreign policy uh -huh. against them. And I wondered, and I see this in Venezuela too, and I agree with you that it's the principal thing that the U.S. strategists get wrong. They don't understand the people yeah. and the movements on the ground. 
So is there anything else that we should talk about that you want to comment on before we let our audience go? Well, let me take this opportunity to, to express our gratitude and our thanks to all our friends uh, in your organization, called Pink Mundo. And in general, the Americans have been scared to have two ways. In all these years, uh, we, we know, we are sure that if things at some moment begun to change, to improve, it was not due to the <coughs> just the good, the good intentions of the good will of a, of a president, but was the result of the, the fight that consistently for many years many Americans have uh, sustained in your country to have uh, a relation of respect and friendship between our two countries. And uh, we, since the very beginning of this story, since the very beginning, to be precise, 1817, mm -hmm. Carlos Manuel de Céspedes, the man that who referred to as the El Padre de la Patria, the father of the Padre de la Patria, the great initiator of the Cuban Revolution. In a message he sent to the Cuban immigrants in New York, who were many at that time, he alert them of what they, what in his views were the intentions of the U.S. Uh, ruling class. In 1870. 1870. The, the, the secret of the American policy is to uh, take over Cuba. Yeah. But he also said to those people, but you never, you will, you should never confuse the government with the people. The American people should be our best friend and our best ally. It is the, the, the essential of our strategy has to be never to forget that the Americans want to take control over Cuba, the government, the ruling class. But the people is not, the people, American people, has nothing to do with that. And we should try to get their solidarity, their friendship to fight the others. 1870. Well, and here in 2019, you have a solidarity in this room of the American people. So, exactly. thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank what you. an honor. So, thank you everyone thank you. for watching, and we'll see you next Wednesday, 12 p.m. Eastern.